So, um, as Rick said, I am a pediatric oncologist at Children's, and I spend 20% of my time in Children's Hospital and the other 80% of the time in the research lab. And I'll start out actually kind of giving you a little background about the clinical side, and then we'll translate that to how this has led to some of the research questions that we've addressed in the lab. So as an oncologist, um, we are interested in uh, how we can reduce cancer overall, because cancer in children at the ages of 1 to 14 is the le leading cause of disease-related death. So accidents and, and uh, suicide um, and homicide um, are, are parts of the piece of the puzzle, with accidents being the, the biggest and then other here and some of the other random things over there. But cancer is the leading cause of disease-related deaths in age 1 to 14 uh, range. As you go to ages 15 to 19, um, Again, cancer is still the leading cause of disease-related death, and um, accidents is still the biggest piece of the puzzle. Unfortunately, suicide and homicide are actually bigger in this age range, uh, but again, cancer is the leading cause of disease-related death. The types of cancers that we take care of, there are probably 10 to 12 different types of cancers that we frequently see as a pediatric oncologist. Uh, the most common type of cancer we take care of in pediatric oncology is leukemia. So about a third of the patients had leukemia. Um, about 25% of the patients have brain tumors, so between the two of them, you have more than half the types of cancers that we take care of. In contrast, adult oncologists, and oncologists who take care of adult patients, um, their primary cancers are lung, colon, breast, and prostate. So the, the types of patients that we see in pediatric cancer are different, um, as well as, as the biology of the types of cancers, the way that they respond to different chemotherapies is different between pediatrics and adults. So I'm gonna, in my lab, we actually focus on three types of cancers, two pediatric cancers and one adult cancer. So in pediatrics, we look at ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Uh, we also look at glioblastoma, which is a form of a brain tumor. And then we look in a, at an adult cancer, non-small cell lung cancer. And all three of them, uh, we track along as looking for new types of therapies, new ways to treat these cancers. And we're, we're uh, having similar approaches for all three types of cancers. So I'm going to talk about leukemia as a model for all three of them, and you can see how it would translate to the other cancers as we go through the slides. So ALL, as I said, is the most common type of cancer in children. There are about 3,000 new diagnoses of, of patients a year in the U.S. And we can cure about um, 80 to 85 percent of the patients long term uh, with cancer. Um, somewhere around 20 percent of them will die of their disease with leukemia. And that's, that's the whole population as a whole. But there are subsets of patients with leukemia that we're not as good with. So there's some types of leukemia that we can only maybe cure 50% of the patients. So there's definitely a need for developing new therapies for leukemia. Um, the type of therapy for leukemia uh, that we use lasts about three years. It consists of chemotherapy. Um, if there is brain involvement or CNS involvement, sometimes they get radiation therapy. Sometimes we have to advance to a bone marrow transplant. And the unfortunate part of the therapy is not only is it a long therapy, but a lot of the medications that we give, even though we have 80% cure, there are significant long-term effects of the therapy that we give. So there's problems with sometimes uh, decreased function on, uh, on, uh, in school. Um, there are endocrine problems with growth. Um, there are sometimes can be complications with organs such as your liver and your heart. Sometimes there are issues with fertility. So really the two questions is, can we devise a therapy that is more effective and a therapy that is less toxic. And the, the way that we have started to address this is really to, to have sort of a paradigm shift in the way that we treat cancer patients. And the traditional types of chemotherapy agents that we use kill rapidly dividing cells. So cancer cells, because they're rapidly dividing, are preferentially killed, but also you're killing hair follicles and you lose your hair. You're killing uh, cells that line your uh, esophagus, esophagus and your intestinal tract. So you have lots of nausea and vomiting that occur. Um, can we get a little bit smarter? Instead of just kill, killing, killing cells that are rapidly dividing, can we selectively kill the tumor cells? Can we find out the signaling pathways or the proteins or the genes that are different in cancer cells? And can we target them specifically and have less toxicity to the normal cells? And the way that you address this now to look at candidate genes that might be different in different types of cancers 
Um, one way to address this is using DNA array technology. And uh, years ago, not you know five or ten years ago, we used to have to say, well, this was an interesting potential oncogene, so let's study this one gene and this one particular type of cancer. And then, well, that one didn't work, so let's go to the next gene and look at this type of cancer. Now we can look at tens of thousands of genes. So some of these arrays have up to 50,000 genes that we can look at all at one time. And the genes that are red are genes that are upregulated, and then these other genes that would be genes that are downregulated. And these are different types of leukemia, so different biologic subsets of pediatric leukemia. And we can find that in different types of leukemias that different genes are turned on. So, you know, leukemia is a very heterogeneous disease, and each type of leukemia, there might be a certain cluster of genes that are abnormal. So the question is, how can we now look at these individual genes, maybe these 50 genes that are different, one type of leukemia than another, and how can we tailor um, leukemia therapy to the subsets, and how can we make smarter chemotherapy drugs? So some of the genes that regulate, that are shown in those red dots, are genes that fall into a type of proteins that are called, uh, that make proteins that are called receptor tyrosine kinases. And the tyrosine kinases affect the cell's ability to grow and divide. And within your body, there are 58 different receptor tyrosine kinases. So they're all along the bottom here. And they're grouped into 20 different families. And my lab actually studies this one family here that's Axel Murrin Tyro 3, shown over here on the side. And this family of receptor tyrosine kinases all have a similar extracellular domain. So this sticks outside the cell. This is the transmembrane region. And this is the intracellular part. And they're activated by ligands that are present in your bone marrow and in your blood. And the ligands are called gas 6 and protein S. And this is the protein S as part of the coagulation cascade that you learned about in, in, a, in high school and college biology. And they activate these receptors. And they cause downstream signaling pathways to be activated. And the pathways that are activated are strongly uh, pro-survival pathways. So they tell the cell not to die if you activate, if you activate these receptor tyrosine kinases. So we found an interesting thing is that in a normal lymphocyte or thymocyte, there should be no expression of these genes, of these receptor tyrosine kinase proteins of Axel and Merck. However, in leukemia patient samples, somehow abnormally these genes get turned on. So the, this is a, an RT-PCR assay of T-cell leukemia patient samples, and about 50% of them somehow abnormally turn on expression of this gene. And not only do they make a transcript by PCR, but they also make the protein abnormally. And so this is a, a Western blot showing that about 50% of the, the patient samples also make the, the abnormal protein. So we, after we define subsets of leukemia that and normally express this, the question was, is this actually contributing to developing the cancer? So to address that question, we made a transgenic mouse that overexpressed this receptor tyrosine kinase MER in the same way that patients have it overexpressed. So we made a MER transgenic mouse, and we used a, a promoter called the VAB promoter, which drives expression in blood cells. And when you uh, um, are making the mouse, you allow your transgene to randomly insert into the chromosome. So these are two lines, an F11 and an F2 line in which your MER transgene is just randomly inserted in, into the chromosomes. And then you look to determine whether or not you have um, driven expression in the cells that you're interested in. So we wanted to find out, can we make MER expressed in thymocytes and lymphocytes? And this is a flow cytometry diagram. And on the left-hand side is the normal lymphocyte and thymocyte in a mouse. And then as you go to the right, you have increasing MER expression. So in our transgenic MER mice and, and thymocytes, now we have more expression. We go from nothing to something. And the same thing in the lymphocytes. There's nothing in the wild type. And in our transgenics, now we have more expression in the lymphocytes in the same way that the patients do. And we can also see this in a Western blot. So there's no more in a wild type lymphocyte, but our transgenic mice have it. There's no more in a wild type thymocyte, and our transgenic mice do. So this now mimics what we see in patients. And the question is, what happens over time if you drive expression in these transgenic mice? The answer is that they develop leukemia and lymphoma just like the patients do. So this is a, a mouse and about half of the mice develop in, and this is a, a big liver and a big spleen. This is what a wild type spleen would look like, and the transgenic mice that develop leukemia have spleens that are about nine times the size. This is a lymph node from the belly of the mouse, and normally a lymph node would be two millimeters, and this is a two and a half centimeter size lymph node. And if you look at the cells inside the lymph node and the spleen, they're just filled with leukemia cells. And we can do flow cytometry to confer that MER is expressed and that they're T cell in origin. So just like the patient samples, our mouse model then mimics the, the development of leukemia and lymphoma. Um, 
the question then became what causes them to develop leukemia lymphoma, and we started to look at signaling pathways that are activated in these leukemia cells, and we found out that certain pathways, including AKG and ERK, are activated, and these again are pro-survival signaling pathways. So the cancer cell is now turned on abnormally these signaling pathways that say don't die, and it's given the survival advantage to the cancer cells. We also found if you express the MER transgene in just normal thymocytes that are not leukemic, that you can increase, I mean, you can decrease the sensitivity to um, a dexamethasone, which is steroid that's used for lots of things, but including it's a backbone of leukemia therapy. So just by normally expressing the MER transgene, you can make it more resistant to certain chemotherapy drugs. So we then wanted to find out, so we think it's contributing to the leukemia. Once you develop leukemia, is the leukemia still dependent upon it for continued survival? Does it, does, is it required for the maintenance of leukemia? And in order to address that, we developed inhibitors, an inhibitor uh, test to, to now have a leukemia cell that has more and then take away the more and find out what happens to the leukemia cell. So we use the technology um, SHRNA, um, which is a, um, a stable knockdown. Um, SIRNA would be a transient, and this is a stable knockdown, and we may colonize the stable knockdown. So these are our wild type cells of the leukemia cells that have the MER, and now we've knocked it down in these two lines, the 1A and the 1B line, and we wanted to find out what happens then to the leukemia. So this would mimic what would happen to a patient. If you have a patient who has MER expression, now if you can take the MER away, what happens to the leukemia cells? And what we found is we were able to take the human leukemia cells and put them into an immunocompromised mouse. So we have a xenograft mouse model. Um, and we wanted to find out how long does it take to develop leukemia in the xenograft mouse. So these are non-skid immunocompromised mice. And in the wild-type mice, it takes about three weeks to develop leukemia. And this is our non in control using the same vector. It takes about three weeks to develop leukemia in the blood and, the, and in the bone marrow. However, if you inhibit MER, and this is about 70% inhibition of MER in these knockdown lines, and now it takes about eight or nine weeks to develop leukemia. So just by knocking down the MER, we can prolong the time to leukemia onset. The other question is, we're never gonna use an inhibitor by itself, and so we're gonna, we wanna find out what happens in conjunction with chemotherapy drugs. Is it gonna work antagonistically to chemotherapy drugs, or could it complement chemotherapy drugs and, and work synergistically? Um, one of the mechanisms of, of leukemia cells having resistance to chemotherapy drugs is the activation of these same pro-survival pathways that this tyrosine kinase activates. So our hope and our hypothesis was that if we inhibit it, not only by itself we, would we have an effect, but we would get a synergistic effect when using it in combination with chemotherapy. And so we were thrilled to find that to be true. So these are MTT assays and basically survival assays. So 25, 50, 75% and 100% survival. And if you have the wild type line in this line, we even with high doses of this chemotherapy drug, we couldn't even kill half of the cells. So we couldn't obtain an IC50, a concentration that killed 50% of the cells. However, if we knock down MER in these two lines, now we have a very nice uh, chemosensitive cell line, one that with just very small doses of this chemotherapy drug can kill the cells. And this is true with two other drugs. So this is etoposide, another very commonly used uh, chemotherapy drug. The wild type line was chemo resistant. Now we can turn the line into a uh, very chemosensitive line. And with adriamycin, even though this line was already sensitive to the chemotherapy, we can make it much more sensitive to the chemotherapy just by knocking down the MER. So the, the the strategy would be you would be able to develop inhibitor um, and you would treat the patient with the inhibitor at the same time that you would give specific chemotherapy drugs to give increased e efficacy of your drug. And then the hope would be not only could you use lower doses, but you could maybe eliminate some of the chemotherapy drugs. You would have less toxicity of your therapy. So we have been working as part of the, um, the Bioscience Discovery Grant to develop these inhibitors. And one of our strategies was to make an, a biologic protein that could bind up all the ligands so that you couldn't activate the receptor. We've had success at being able to do this in vitro, and we're moving now into the animal models with these protein inhibitors that we've developed. So this is a phosphomer or an activated MER assay, and by itself in the presence of ligand, we get activation, but with our protein inhibitor, our biologic inhibitor that we've developed, we've been able to completely block MER activation. And not only can we block the activation of the protein, but we can block the activation of these pathways, including AKT, which is this part of this pro-survival downstream signaling pathway. Uh, with our inhibitor, we can block the activation of phosphor AKT. 
So in vitro, this is uh, very promising, and now we're just starting to do some of the in vivo assays with our xenograft to be able to show the same thing is true. If we give them leukemia, can we give the inhibitors? And by itself, can we prolong the time to leukemia? And then with chemotherapy, can we synergize and cure the leukemia altogether? <coughs> so this is the, uh, the, the last slide before the summary, just saying that this tyrosine kinase, the Mer tyrosine kinase, um, and its relative axle are overexpressed in lots of different types of cancers. And we're focusing on leukemia and lymphoma. Um, we found similar data with our tech transfer uh, grant or biosynthesis discovery grant in non-small cell lung cancer. We've been able to inhibit Mernaxil and also so show synergy with chemotherapy in a very similar way because some of the same pathways are activated in some of the brain tumor lines. And, and in all three of these, we're progressing to animal models with these inhibitors. So in summary, I've shown you that Mernaxil are two tyrosine kinases that are abnormally expressed, um, that if you inhibit the Mer, you have um, increased survival in the mice, they have synergy with chemotherapy. Because of this, these are attractive candidates for biologically targeted therapy. And in summary, I just want to uh, thank uh, people in the lab and the collaborators, and especially the, the funding that I received in the last year from the Biosciences Discovery Grant to help us develop these inhibitors for the tyrosine kinases. Thank you. Yes? Um, so is the MER uh, overexpression, is that in any way related to the translocation on chromosome 22 with the ABLE, the C ABLE and, and the other. And then the other thing is GLEVAC is a tyrosine inhibitor. That's exactly right. Anyway, and so um, how effective is GLEVAC in ALL versus CML and some of the others? Yeah, great, fantastic question. So so the, the, the first answer is that there are a number of receptor tyrosine kinases that contribute to different types of leukemia mm -hmm. and, and different types of cancer. So with GLEVAC, we know that it's important uh, primarily in CML, chronic myelogenous leukemia, and in certain subsets of ALL. Um, and, and just as I showed you that array that showed that there are different biologic subsets that are activated, the, the the types of leukemia that MER is activated in are different from the types of ones that um, ABLE is, the 922 translocation that the Philadelphia chromosome is activated. Um, the second answer is that we are actually screening uh, receptor tyrosine kinase libraries to find out if we can discover a, a receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitor that may be effective against this family. And there are some drug companies that are trying to specifically make some that are against this family too. Okay. 